Hello, Adrian Stramp. Hello, Richard. How are you doing there? I am very well, and I'm very happy to be here today. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me. Oh, look, delighted. Um, and your exhibition is quite simply entitled New Work. It's at King Street Gallery on William in Sydney. Um, and just before we have a chat, a reminder to the viewer, as I usually do, that the idea with these interviews is to be able to go to the gallery website to find the exhibition catalogue or the images for the exhibition and to have a look at those images at the same time as listening to our conversation because we will be referring to, to specific images and that's what will give people the, the best value out of this chat. Um, so Adrian, lovely to have the chat and, and let me start just with the, the, very, the very general kind of observation that as someone looks at a, a wide range of your images, there is this element of some uncertainty. One's not quite sure what it is that one's looking at. There is a, a certain mystery about them. Is that, is that your absolute intent? It is my intent, yes. Um, I'm, I think that I am not, I'm not, I'd like to start with saying I'm actually, I don't see myself as a landscape painter and I um, use the landscape, but I will use other elements as well. Um, a large part of that sort of diffusing process is more about kind of like I'm trying to make something that looks familiar to everyone, but you can't quite put your finger on it or what it is or where it is. And, um, and I think that's kind of a long story, but it goes, back to my own sort of um, background when I was growing up. Well, and, and that background, I think, is that you, you moved a lot. Uh, your, yeah. your father's professional obligations meant that you moved a great deal as a child. And so there was this sense of constantly shifting. And in a way, yeah. is that partly what your works reflect? That is very largely what my works reflect, yes. It's, um, so because we moved so much, I... Um, it's kind of like I have a, um, you know, I'm very comfortable with moving around, but I don't have that sort of, that permanent sort of history or place that I am attached to. I can kind of go to any new place and be, make myself feel at home fairly quickly, but I don't have that long, you know, like the kids you went to school with or, you mm -hmm. know, people. Yes. high school days and I don't I can't remember anyone's names there were too many schools and um so because of that moving you know I don't have that sort of connection to one particular place that I would say is home so sort of home can be anywhere for me wherever I am or but I have attachments to places too so often my work will go back to sort of things I remember elements of things that I remember about a place that I, you know, where we lived or that I was, um, have happy memories of or, and then I'll kind of collate them. So I might take, you know, an element from, um, you know, an incident when I was a child that I remember quite strongly. And then I might use a little bit of an Australian landscape in the background, or um, I can, I kind of fuse different times and places and so often I find people look at the paintings, um, particularly the landscape ones, and they might say, oh, I know where that is. But it never is any one specific place. It's, mm. it's kind of a combination. Yes, yes. And, uh, and there is, actually, we'll talk about them a little later in the chat, but th there are a series of works in this exhibition um, which very much look as though you're moving along. I think they were, in fact, derived from a, a train journey uh, that you yes. took in, in the United Kingdom. Um, but, but they have that sense of places fleeting past, perhaps like those many different residencies uh, as a child that, uh, that, that travelled past you. Um, but I want to go to, let's, let's go to some specific works. Um, and I'm just going back to that sense of, of uncertainty, of, of it not being quite clear what's going on. Uh, perhaps a particularly strong example of that would be Light Falls. Oh, uh, yes. <laughs> it's very misty and, and uncertain, but what is going on? What, what are you trying to evoke in a, work, in a work like that? What's the feeling that you want people to respond with? Well, actually that work is, um, that is actually based on my current home here in Melbourne. 
and it is um i live in an old warehouse that i kind of renovated myself and i put in these beautiful old windows that come from a um they were from a local uh, primary school so i've tried to keep all my building materials second hand and recycled and the the very beautiful windows and they Every afternoon, the light falls through these windows, and because they're sort of multi-paned, old-fashioned windows, mm. uh, and it's quite high, quite a high ceiling. Uh, there's this beautiful sort of light that just goes across the room, and in the afternoon, and I often photograph it, and because it's just, it's just a really funny sort of thing. It's like a really particular light, and it's, especially in the winter, in the afternoons, it's really beautiful, and and it goes across one of my very dark paintings, one of my very dark gray paintings. So in the afternoon, you can't actually see the image on, of the painting anymore, but this light goes across it. And um, you can actually see it on my Instagram feed. I often take photos of it and put it on Instagram. Um, but that painting is very, if you see that room, you will very clearly recognize that's what's happening. Um, that's, it's it's so fascinating it, because that is, that is a, a, a beautiful, and, and very concrete description of what's happening in the painting. And yet the painting itself slightly seems to hide that from you. But now that you've explained it, it will be lovely for, for people to be able to, to see that. Um, and similarly with um, uh, another work, uh, Flux, which seems to be in many ways a very recognisable landscape. I mean, I don't mean recognisable in the sense of knowing where it is, but recognisable that it is a landscape. Um, but there is a, a mysterious column of light or a, an impediment of light, if you like, across part of the landscape. Again, what, what's the choice for you in placing a, a, a little bit of mystery or a little bit of visual impediment for the viewer? Oh, yeah, that's a very common technique that I use a lot in, in my work. And um, the flux is actually based on a quite a specific place. It's up in the northern, very northern part of Wisconsin, where I was, um, where I spent some time growing up. I was born in the States and, and I used to go up to the um, northern part of the state with my cousin quite a lot as a child and up to this particular lake and um, where she's just been at them recently um, and sending me some photos, it was lovely. Um, but it's kind of my memory of that place. But again, it's, I you know, I don't want to just paint the landscape and say, oh, that's a lovely landscape and I'm gonna paint that. It's more my emotional connection to it. And so my memory of going there as a child. And as you get older, you know how your memories sometimes start to no, they change. They're not, you know, as you mature, they get your, your memories change a little bit. You remember different things, some things fade away. So, and you don't, it's less and less sort of clear. So those sort of barrier marks that I use or interference marks that I often put on my paintings are a way of me, A, saying, I'm not here. I'm looking at it, but I'm from the outside as an observer. So I'm not in the landscape is a part of it but I'm the outsider which is kind of you know relating to my background and um in flux I'm sorry, sorry in, um in flux where it's got that sort of vertical pink stripe that runs through the work it's a, it's one of those barriers that it's kind of like a bit of dissolving going on so a bit of the image is dissolving which is a bit like my memory of that place I, I was just going to say from how you describe it memory uh, that sense of, of inviting the viewer to look at, perhaps even share your memory, even with its slight sense of distancing from the actual place or the object, is part of what's happening. How, how important is memory in the work? I, I, well, I think it's hugely important because it's, for me, it's what I can, it's that I suppose my memory is my home. It's my collation of of memories that makes up who I am and, and what I am, because I don't have that one thing I can just say that is me, you know, that is where I'm from. That's, that's, a, great, that's a great phrase that uh, you know, memory is my home. Um, and, and perhaps also, as you've said, memory is my identity. It's what makes all of us who we mm. are. 
Um, but going to a very specific, you know, we mentioned, I mentioned earlier uh, the, the images where uh, the outside world seems to be travelling past you uh, is, oh, yes. in fact, presumably what was happening on a train trip that you took in the United Kingdom and a, a number of works, I think, in the exhibition from that. But the, the, the most obvious one is 1.29 p.m. to Paddington. Presumably that was the train time. <laughs> um, was. Yeah, yeah. So, so tell us about uh, some of those images and some of them are labelled as very sp specific places, perhaps along the way, presumably. Yeah, yeah. So um, my parents live now in, well, for some time now, they have resettled in one place. And that was one of the places where I used to spend a lot of time as a child. Um, in Somerset on the southwest coast of England and so I you know I go back to see them and it's a usually a two to three depending on which which train you get it can take an hour and a half to three hours to get there yes. um, and so I'm very familiar with that train journey down and um, about halfway through as you're heading towards Reading there's a lot of canals and I'm and I always love seeing the canals because they're um you know you don't they're so quintessentially English and you we don't see them here so, you know you don't see canals here and barges and people live on barges and so when you're going on the on the train there it, it that landscape is is flicking past quite fast and the canal kind of weaves I love the way it sort of weaves its way in and out and suddenly it's they're parallel to the train tracks for a while and then it disappears and then it re-emerges. And so there was something about that rhythm and those flashes of the sky reflected in the water, the stillness of the water in that compared to the, you know, the, the speed that we were traveling and yet the sort of stability of the water. And this, I think it, I think those sort of images, they kind of, I felt very connected to them because I, I suppose the journey is another part of my background, that constant, on the move and traveling. So I'm quite mm. attracted to that sort of ambiguity of, of getting those, trying to get those very fleeting moments. Well, in the specific work called Reading Canal, um, you capture that, but also I have to say the, uh, the, the feeling of the canal, and I think we can even see somebody on a, a small boat uh, or some sort of craft on the canal. There is a sense of it being, as you say, that the canal itself being quite a solid, stable um, uh, subject. Mm within the painting. Uh, but there's another work, um, M Molesford, I hope I'm pronouncing the place correct. Molesford, Molesford? Molesford, yeah. Molesford. Um, and in Molesford, there is a, a quite strong sense of movement. Literally, almost the image seems to slightly slide in the painting itself. Uh, so that does seem to be a bit more on the move. Yeah, um, well, they, I mean, they all are. They're all about, all those um, paintings in the show, they're mostly smaller works. Um, they are about just that train journey and that movement. So, you know, um, that landscape was changing all the time. So I was just trying to capture what I saw, really. Mm. And, you, and you've, so, you've, oh, evoked, you've evoked that beautifully. Um, just going to some of the practicalities of it, uh, as we look at the works, uh, the palettes that you use seem to be uh, very disciplined, uh, very restricted, um, and and deliberately muted. How has that evolved? Yeah, I am a bit of a paint nerd. I um... <laughs> <laughs> that's a great that's a great label to wear with pride. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I am a paint nerd. I confess. Um, yeah, I'm like very specific about it. Um, you know, I will. I will check the back of a tube of paint before I buy it to see the pigment numbers and, you know, make sure that there's hopefully only one pigment in it. Not, you know, like I'm, I'm a bit of a purist about mm. color mixing. Um, so I like to use a limited palette and I like to push it as, as far as I can. So I'll usually choose just one sort of reddish color, one vaguely bluish color, or maybe, um, Occasionally, I use something called the Zorn palette, which is a um, yes, yes, hardcore <laughs> minimalist palette. Um, but that's used that. that's used a lot in portraits, isn't it? Yes, yeah, yeah. But um, 
you know, it's quite interesting. I find it interesting. I mean, it's probably deadly boring for everybody else, but I, I really find it interesting to see how far you can stretch the colors. So, you know, if you have one red, one blue and one yellow, you can mix your own black and then you can gray them. You know, you can make endless shades of in between and then you can gray them off with a little bit of the black you've mixed, or you can lighten them up with a little bit of white. And so you can end up with this incredibly beautiful palette, but the colors are still connected because they originate from the same sort of, you know, gene pool. You mentioned you know? mixing your own black, um, and, and I understand that you, you don't use black, you do tend to mix your own. Um, yeah. th that is actually quite a challenging thing to get right and to make work well, <laughs> isn't it? It, it is, um, although I can I pretty much do it with my eyes closed now. <laughs> but, um, <laughs> it's look, you know, if you buy if you buy a tube of black, it's um, you know it's uh, you know people they'll sometimes just use it straight out of the tube, and sometimes it's look like leaves like a big hole in the painting because it might be a cold blue black or a brown black. So when you mix your own, it just kind of sits much better. Uh, just to um, as a side note, I, you know, I, I finished, I did my, I went back to school and I did my master's, um, which I finished in 2010. And my thesis was on gray. So I, spent, I wrote, I think. Uh, <laughs> that is great. I think, I think we are now completely convinced that you are a paint nerd and, uh, yeah. you know, with first class honors. Um, but actually just before that time, you mentioned 2010, but uh, in 2009, you, you paid a trip to Venice, a, a quite important one, because you were looking, amongst other things, at the work of Tintoretto and, and the layering techniques. And mm -hmm. that layering seems so important in your work. What, what did you learn from Tintoretto? Oh, I have, to, I have to tell you, I'm not a Tintoretto fan, but I did ah. go to this to see his work, <laughs> yes. Um, you know, they're very dark images, they're very dark. But I, um, I was, while I was there, I was fortunate enough to see one of his works that was being restored. And it was, um, it had been taken off the stretcher. And so you could see the edges of the canvas and, you, and I was able to see the layers of color that he had built up to get, achieve that sort of darkness. And what I had thought, and what I was able to see was that he, in fact, used a lot of transparent colors so that he could layer up the colors of, in different sorts of reds and yellows and blues. So he would get almost a black painting, but it had this incredible light that traveled through the, through the layers so that it wasn't a, you know, a dense, heavy painting. It still had the lightness, but it was very, very dark. So uh, you, you may not be a fan of, uh, of the eventual works that, that he produced, but some of those techniques have really informed your approach. Yes, very much so, yeah. yeah I, I work in layers myself, and um, very, I work in very fine, thin layers, and I build them up before I start dissolving them or you know, wiping them back, and, um, and then I'll throw more on. With the, um, when I... Um, when I was still working in a monochromatic way with the black or the gray paintings, I would build up so many layers that um, sometimes, you know, I think, oh, it just needs one more. And you can be so light with just a little bit of paint and a lot of medium, and I'd just float one more layer on top, and then the whole image would just disappear, and it was too dark, and it was gone, completely oh. gone. Tragic. Oh, well, <laughs> let's move away from the tragedy, but it does actually, no, I mean, it really does give us a very good sense of just what a, a very fine balance that, that layering process is. Moving to um, something uh, which um, we could actually see on the studio wall behind you, uh, one of the works um, has a horse in it. And uh, I, I wanted to refer to uh, some of the horses. Works of yours in the past have had horses, uh, stags, hares, you know, various um, animals often caught in what almost seems like a frozen moment. Um, and uh, there's one work in the exhibition that we're talking about, The Marshes, where mm -hmm. there is a horse uh, thoughtfully in the mists or appears to be, you know, just contemplating in the mists. Give us a little bit of a, of a sense of why you include animals like horses and those others and, uh, and tell us a bit about the marshes. Um, 
Okay. Um, well, the animals appear in my work, particularly the horses. Um, they tend to appear as a sort of a, a symbol of, of transition. So it's not, I don't think about it as, oh, I'm going to start painting horses. It just, the horse has been in and out of my work ever since art school days. And it seems to always happen when I'm just kind of in a shift with the work. If, the, um, you know, I, I don't kind of conjure it up, it just happens. And then after, um, after a while, they just sort of just, you know, leave. And <laughs> it's, it's sort of out of my control. I just, when it happens, it happens and I let them go. And, <laughs> and, then, and then once that I'm sort of settled in that new body of work, they, they disappear. But I, I think with the horse, I mean, I used to ride when I was a child and I think what I like about the, and like about the horses and kind of relate to them, I suppose they're part of the uh, sort of semi audio autobiographical element for me. The, the, um, I like the fact that they, you know, that you can never quite control them. They're, you know, they they can be a bit flighty and, and, and a little bit vulnerable, but they're also incredibly strong. Um, so I think, with the other animals that have appeared in my work, it's been, I've only ever been attracted to the animals that are, have that same sense of, of independence and that sort of willfulness, I suppose. But, you know, not, um, I don't know, there's just a, there's something about the ones that, are, do you know what I'm trying to say? I find it hard to put quite, it in words. It's like unpredictability. You, ju you just don't know quite which way they're going to jump, you know, whether they're mm. a or a stag or a horse and, and those animals like hares and stags very much a European sensibility I guess as well. Yeah well I suppose I you know um, I, I mainly went to school in England and so that's kind of feels the most like home to me any you know be hanging around in Europe and so I have that sort of more European sensibility. Um, I did do um, a residency with some of the other King Street artists at Taronga Zoo a while ago quite a while ago now, um, but I think it was 2011. Um, but I, and there I, I fell in love with one of the tapirs and ended up doing a large series of drawings on him. Oh, wonderful <laughs> animals. Oh. <laughs> I know. Um, Baran, um, I have to confess, I have a tapir t-shirt, uh, which was sent to me by a, a, a dear friend who um, went to a tapir, a world tapir conference. Uh, and oh. so I, I share your tapir enthusiasm. <laughs> I am jealous. <laughs> I want one. Uh, look, we should come towards a conclusion, but uh, before we do, I do want to ask you about uh, a series of small works, um, World Weather and Disasters. Oh, yes. Uh, yes. Intriguing, again, slightly amb ambiguous small works, but one does get a sense in these very small works of great natural forces in play. Tell us what's happening. Yeah, um, occasionally I like to work on a very small scale uh, and those works are all very small works on paper. Uh, what, hap what happened was, was I was actually really sick. I was at home and um, I couldn't come to the studio for a month and I was, uh, I was so sick. But I, after a while I was able to sit at the kitchen table and I was desperate to start working again. So small works on paper are kind of something manageable. Um, and I often sort of look for, you know, when I'm painting, you know, um, if I'm looking for particular sort of skies, say, for, you know, like one of these larger landscapes, I might use that sort of collage of elements from my past, but I might be looking for, um, you know, a more dramatic pink sky. So I'll kind of trawl through news images and um, Google or, you know, everywhere until I find something that strikes the right chord with me. And so, I, I kind of got a little bit obsessed with some of the nat, um, natural disasters that, and how incredi they're incredibly beautiful, you know, and dramatic, but also terrifying and devastating so often. So those little works were something about having them so small contains them, you know, they're not very dangerous. <laughs> they're, they're, they're just small little works on paper, but, and they're, they're sort of very beautiful, but they're, they're something very often very tragic at the same time. Yeah. And again, as you mentioned much earlier near the, the beginning of our conversation, it's something that you're viewing from a distance. You're not actually in it. You're looking at it. And, uh, and, and these small works give you the chance to do that. Okay. Thank you 
for, for uh, working through these uh, works in your exhibition. Um, and we should mention that uh, this present exhibition is a smaller version of the exhibition you were anticipating having at this time. Uh, tell us actually what's, what's happening with the, the future of, uh, of, of the exhibited works. Well, um, so what we've done is we've curated a, a smaller selection of the work that's going to be in the exhibition just uh, to, in order to get, um, give people a, a preview, I suppose, of the show that it will now be rescheduled down the track. Um, and actually on Monday, um, on Monday the trucks, the art trucks just started running interstate again. So I couldn't get the work up to Sydney from here um, until then. So I think it's actually due to arrive today. Um, the exhibition will be rescheduled and it will be a much larger show. And um, I think you'll have to wait and see. I'm still, <laughs> I'm still painting, so I'll be adding new works to the show as well, I go I, and I might pull some out. <laughs> I look forward to the opportunity to have a conversation with you then as well. But for now, um, Adrian Stramp, thank you very much for sharing your exhibition. Oh, thank you so much, Richard. It's been a pleasure. Thank you.